In modern translations of the Bible, the word Moriah is used only twice. Genesis 22, 2. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest, even Isaac, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. 2 Chronicles 3, 1 Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, in Mount Moriah, where the Lord appeared unto David his father, for which provision had been made in the place of David, in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. So we see Moriah is the name of the mountain, which name itself translates as consecrated by the Lord, upon which Abraham sought to sacrifice his son to Elohim, his Lord God, and that it was upon this same mountain that the wise king of the Jews, Solomon, would, fifteen generations later, build his temple to Abraham's Lord God. First, let us follow the travels of Abraham during his era to establish the location of Mount Moriah, where, later, Solomon would construct his temple. The Book of Jubilees states that Ur was founded in 1688 Anno Mundi, Year of the World, by Ur, son of Kesed, presumably the offspring of Arphaxad, adding that in this same year, wars began on earth. And Ur, the son of Kesed, built the city of Ara, of the Chaldees, and called its name after his own name and the name of his father, i.e. ur Kasdim. Jubilees 11.3 So we find that the most likely place of Abraham's birth and early formative youth was in ur Kasdim, a city-state in Sumero, Acadia, on the coast of the Persian Gulf in its time, founded during the Ubiad period, 5,800 years ago or so, on the south shore of the southernmost Euphrates River, modern-day Iraq. We are told in Seder Olam that Abraham was the firstborn son of Terah, and the Talmud infers the date of Abraham's birth to have occurred in 1948 Anno Mundi, circa 1813, B.C. While in ur Kazdim, according to rabbinical tradition and Zohar, as well as in Muslim Quran, where Terah is called Azar, Abraham, then called Abram, quarreled with his father Terah, an idolatrous priest, according to Midrash Haggadol, who owned a shop selling graven images of the Sumerian pantheon. According to Rabbi Hia in Genesis Rabbah, Terah left Abram to mind the store while he departed. A woman came with a plateful of flour and asked Abram to offer it to the idols. Abram then took a stick, broke the idols, and put the stick in the largest idol's hand. When Terah returned, he demanded that Abram explain what he'd done. Abram told his father that the idols fought among themselves and the largest broke the others with the stick. Why do you make sport of me? Terah cried. Do they have any knowledge? Abram replied, Listen to what you're saying. The Tanakh in Genesis 11, explains to us how Abraham, then still called Abram, left ur Kazdim with his wife and half-sister Sarai, his brother Nahor II, and his nephew Lot, and their patriarch Terah, and how the family altogether settled in the city of Haran, 
a Hurrian city in formerly Assyrian lands, presently called Turkey, far to the north of Sumero Acadia, in modern day Iraq. At the age of 205 years old, Terra, the family patriarch, died in the city of Haran. In Hebrew tradition, Abram left Haran prior to his father Terah's death. In Samaritan, Christian, and some Islamic traditions, Abram is said to have left Haran after Terah died. Abram left Haran with Sarai, his half-sister wife, and with Lot, his nephew, and they traveled to Shechem in Canaan, a land called now the Levant, and comprised of the Mediterranean coastal lands southward from Lebanon to the Egyptian Nile, and inland eastward to the Jordan River Valley. In Shechem, later the polity of Nablus, located in the Ephraim hill country between Mounts Ebal and Gerizim, near this Canaanite town, Shechem, Abram made his first sacrificial offering to his Lord God, specifically in the hilly Moray plains south of Mount Tabor, among a grove of terebinth trees. It was here Abram built his first altar to his Lord God. Abram continued having visions of his Lord God, and his next experience has been recalled as Berith Bayan Habaratrim, or the covenant of pieces or parts, wherein his vision promises Abraham his descendants will rise up to rule the lands then occupied by ten different kingdoms, four hundred years after Abram's own lifetime. This vision of his Lord God occurred to Abram on Mount Betarim, one of the peaks of Mount Dove, along the modern border of Lebanon and Syria, between Sheba in Lebanon and Masada in former Syria, modern-day occupied Golan Heights. According to modern documentary hypothesis, the references to this event in modern Tanakh vary due to there being a plurality of scribal sources in ancient times when the text was first recorded. One, the Jawist scribe, always using the term Yahweh, meaning God. Another, the Elohist, always using the term Elohim, meaning my Lord as well as priestly scribal colophons made along the way. In Genesis 12 and 15, Abram's Lord God offers these lands as an unconditional covenant with Abram and his descendants. But in Genesis 17, this covenant is amended to stipulate all his descendants be marked by Brit Malah, circumcision, a form of ritual genital mutilation to be performed on infant males. When Abram was 99 years old, his Lord God proclaimed Abram's name to then be Abraham, meaning a father of many nations. In thanks for this event, Abraham circumcised himself and his firstborn son Ishmael, then aged 13, whom was born to their maidservant Hagar the Egyptian. When Abraham was aged 100 years, his second son was born, the firstborn to his half-sister wife, Sarai, and circumcised on his eighth day following birth. When this son of Abraham and Sarai, named Isaac, meaning, he will laugh, was around the age of 37, and Ishmael, presumably, was aged 51. Abraham exiled Ishmael and Hagar, attempted to sacrifice Isaac to his Lord God, and Sarai died, all in relatively rapid succession. 
Abraham, then aged 137 years, began a ritual commemorated to this day known as the Akedah, binding in Hebrew of Isaac, or as the Dabi, slaughter in Arabic of Ishmael, according to differing sources. According to the Hebrew Tonic and the Christian Old Testament, Isaac was bound by his father Abraham, who was poised to make a living offering of his son to his Lord God, when, all of a sudden, a ram appeared and offered its throat to be cut instead of Abraham's sons. Probably simultaneously to this event, we are told Abraham cast out Ishmael and Hagar into the wilderness in Genesis 21, and they settled in the lands of Beersheba, where, according to Genesis 22, Abraham also later settled, and, according to Persian Arab Muslim historical and theological scholar Abu Jafar Muhammad ibn Jarir al Tabari, writing in the early decades of the 8th century AD, Abraham continued to visit Ishmael and to give him paternal advice. According to legends recorded by by Al-Tabari. Abraham gave the black stone to Ishmael to complete the construction of the Kaaba in Mecca and personally implemented the original Hajj pilgrimage there himself. Sarai died and Abraham subsequently married a concubine named Ketera and sired by her six sons. Abraham died at age 175 years and was buried, according to Genesis 25 and 1 Chronicles 1, by both his most favored sons, Isaac and Ishmael, together. Until only recently, the Tanakh was the only original source for descriptions of either Solomon or his temple. No archaeological evidence existed to confirm his existence, nor to refute the traditional religious beliefs about either. In late 2014 AD, Mississippi State University archaeologists excavating at Kiribit Sumali, an Iron Age 2A site in the south of modern Israel, uncovered a collection of six bulai or official clay seals dating from around at least 900 BC, Gregorian. King Solomon, if he did exist, would have, as his positive regnal dates, 970 to 931 BC. Excavations beginning in 2009 at Telburna a possible match for the ancient lost city of Libna, discovered it had been more or less continuously inhabited throughout the Bronze and Iron Ages, although it would have been directly on the border between Judah and Philistia in the later Iron Age. Excavations at Telburna demonstrate that location to have been inhabited as long ago as 12,000 BC, and at least from the 800s to the 600s BC, continuously. According to biblical legend, the Temple of Solomon was destroyed in 587 BC by Nebuchadnezzar II. Telburna has at least one courtyard 52 squared feet in area. If indeed Telburna is Libna, a Levitical city which revolted in the 800s BC against Jehoram, 2 Chronicles 21, of the southern kingdom of Judah, established following King Solomon's death, citing that he had abandoned the god of his fathers, then why would it have been considered a pagan cult dwelling there by excavation director Itzhak Shai of Ariel University? 
possibly attributable to the Canaanite deity Baal or to the contemporary war goddess Anat. Countless strange artifacts have been uncovered at Tel Berna, which indicated to have been possibly a center for cultists of Baal. Dozens of vases, some the size of adult humans, votive statues with indistinct eroded features, a hieroglyphic inscribed Egyptian ivory scarab, triply combined goblets, and relics of masks or possibly clay death shrouds are among the variety of relics unearthed at Telburna. According to the 13th degree of Scottish Rite Freemasonry, Solomon's original choice for where to place his temple to the God of Abraham was near Jerusalem, but he found an older temple that had been built there already, which he, at first, falsely presumed to be of heathen origins. This earlier temple, discovered but mistaken for heathen by King Solomon, was, according to the Royal Arch Degrees History Lecture, actually built over the underground vaults of a much older temple than he had at first suspected even predating the Great Flood. Solomon mimicked the architecture of this earlier temple from before the Great Flood in the architecture of his own temple and carved a sequence of nine subterranean vaults deeper and deeper into Mount Moriah with the deepest vault being buried directly beneath the Holy of Holies in his first temple and with a long and narrow tunnel hewn out of the rock, leading from these vaults to the king's palace. Supposedly, it was in this ninth chamber vault the Ark of the Covenant was kept when it was not being venerated in the Holy of Holies. And in the mid-1900s, explorer Charles Warren apparently rediscovered this tunnel, although it remains considered only an underground waterway. The Standing Height Tunnel was finally done being cleared out in 1996. In 1 Kings 11 of Hebrew Tanakh and the Christian Old Testament, we are told Solomon's wives turned his heart after other gods, and that in particular he fell prey to attraction by Astoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Moloch, the abomination of the Ammonites. Although we may assume Solomon consorted with as many devils as we like to imagine him doing so with, be it the 72 Goetia of the Shem Ham Farash, or be it only Asmodeus alone, then the king of demons. There is no canonical literary evidence of Solomon personally following after the Canaanite Baal. However, it is widely accepted now that at Shechem, the place of Abraham's first altar to his Lord God, worship of Baal Barit, meaning the God of the Covenant, persisted at least until immediately following the death of Judge Gideon, Judges 6 through 8, and his refusal to be crowned king by them after his 40 years of peaceful rulings, when the Israelites turned to worshiping Baal Barith instead. According to the Muslim Quran, from the surah called Sabah, the faithful learned by Solomon's dying act that the jinn he naturally commanded were not all-knowing, because, with his last act of strength, Solomon stood, and, leaning on his walking stick, he died, but remained standing, so that none of the faithful, nor the jinn, knew he was dead, until a termite ate away his staff, and he collapsed. 
According to the scriptures, he died of natural causes at around 80 years of age. There are four presently known and widely accepted sources for the apocryphal book of Enoch. One Enoch is Ethiopian Enoch, only rediscovered to Western civilization by James Bruce, a Scottish traveler who visited Ethiopia from 1767 to 1773, but it was discarded and forgotten again until being translated from Ethiopian Gies into Latin and republished in the early 1800s. Two Enoch is Slavonic or Slavic Enoch and in this version survived in more than 20 manuscripts dating from the 1300s to 1700s, only becoming popularly discussed by scholars during the end of the 1800s. Three Enoch is Hebrew Enoch or the book of Rabbi Ishmael the high priest, and is attributed to Ishmael HaKohen, a high priest during the Second Temple era in Jerusalem prior to 70 AD. The fourth source for the Book of Enoch are Greek, Hebrew, and Coptic scroll fragments found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, kept from the first century AD until being rediscovered in the 20th century AD by Bedouin farmers in jars stored along the cliff-faced shores of the 34.2% salinity Dead Sea. While both one Enoch and two Enoch are thought to have originated from a single source, presumably the fragments of Enoch found in Coptic, Greek, and Hebrew among the Dead Sea Scrolls near Qumran, Three Enoch is unique from this trend in many ways. It seems to have been written at a time when it would have been easiest for its most probable author to have access to the contents of these Dead Sea Scrolls, including four Enoch, at a time in aeon prior to their being reduced to mere fragments as they are now. Portions of one and two Enoch including the Book of the Watchers, detailing the fall of the rebel angels, are suspected to date back to 200 to 300 B.C. In 3 Enoch, Rabbi Ishmael, its author, describes Enoch being escorted on his first vision by the ministering angels Uzzah, Azza, and Azael. In 1 Enoch, and expanded upon in four Enoch's fragmentary sources. The archangel Uriel is Enoch's guide during his astronomical visions. In one Enoch, the characteristic archangels referred to God amongst themselves as the Lord of Spirits, but in three Enoch, God is referred to religiously only as the Holy One, blessed be He. But Though one Enoch may contain portions far more ancient in their origins, three Enoch is definitely a work of the early 1st century AD, era Hekalot, throne, and Merkaba, chariot, literature. Although these may be the only sources of a truly autobiographical work by a pre-diluvial patriarch, there remain other biographical sources that describe events in Enoch's life. Some of these are intuitive, such as the exegesis on the Tanakh compiled into the Zohar, or the brief mention of his walking with God and dying not for God took him, in the words of Genesis 5 of Tanakh and the Old Testament. However, other references are less obvious such as the connection mentioned before to the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, or such as even a direct connection to Plato's descriptions of Atlantis. In the Zohar, once he has ascended as Metatron, 
Enoch is given 45 keys to the concealed engravings used by the supernal angels. In 3 Enoch, Enoch again having already ascended to become the Archangel Metatron, explains he has 70 names as well as the nickname of Youth. In Genesis, Enoch lived 365 years before being taken by God and ascended to become the Metatron. The name given to Enoch by his father, Jared, of the lineage of Seth, was the same as that given to Cain's firstborn son, Cain being the brother of Seth. Like the later Enoch of Sethite descent, Cain's son Enoch was a builder, but he was also the founder and ruler of a city by his name, established by Cain in the so-called Land of Nod, east of Eden. While Sethite Enoch lived 365 years, and then God took him, according to the canonized Vulgate, according to Josephus, contemporary historian to the Vulgate's canonization, Enoch, the son of Cain, had two wives and sired 77 children. According to Jubilees 4, 9, the wife of Cain and mother of this elder Enoch was named Awan. Although we are told in Genesis 5, 21, Enoch begat Methuselah, no names of the wives of men for the lineage of Sethites have been provided. In the 13th degree of Scottish Rite Free and Accepted Masonry, the so-called Royal Arch Degree, the history lesson is given that Enoch the Sethite had had a vision and a dream of Mount Hermon, where the Watchers descended to earth and conspired to take unto themselves the wives of men. Led along by the voice of God, promising to reveal to Enoch his true name, Enoch journeys in the Masonic histories to the lands of Canaan, where he hired workmen to construct an underground vault of nine chambers, each deeper than the one before it, that would, thirty-four generations later, be rediscovered by King Solomon and mistaken for a heathen temple. Settling in a land we know only to be near Jerusalem, Enoch the Sethite hired on workers to dig the nine-chamber deep vault, housing in its lowest level the true name of God, engraved on a golden triangle, sunk into a cube of agate. Enoch the Sethite also hired these workers to craft two obelisks for him, according to Masonic traditions, one made of brass to survive a flood, and one made of granite to resist any amount of fire. As the story goes, Enoch inscribed on the granite pillar the location of his buried vault, containing the true name of God and on the brass pillar was written the rudiments of the arts and sciences. It is said, then, that after the flood destroyed the pillar of granite and washed away all trace of the buried true name engraved on the cube of agate, Noah rediscovered Enoch's brass pillar. We do not have the content for the original Scotch master degrees conferred at Temple Bar Lodge in 1733 in London, at Bath in 1735, or at the French St. George of the Observance No. 49 at Covent Garden in 1736. As we have no records of former holders of these titles prior to Etienne Morin, the first Grand Inspector, patent issued August 27th, 1761, of his network of Ecossias lodges based out of La Cap Francais, northern French colony of Saint Domingue. 
modern Haiti. By the time the 25 degree Morin's right had become the order of Prince of the Royal Secret and issued their circular manifesto throughout the two hemispheres on December 4th, 1802, the probable motive for creating this rite in the first place, as well as the source for the original author's knowledge about Enoch, were most likely already lost. How the Scottish Rite came to venerate Enoch in its histories as early as 1733, when James Bruce wouldn't even find one Enoch in Ethiopia until 1773, some 40 years later, remains one of the great unsolved anomalies of Enochian research. Written down around 360 BC, Plato's excerpts on Atlantis, that legendary oceanic superpower from beyond the pillars of Hercules, in which ancient Athens alone could defeat them, encapsulated in two works, the Timaeus and Critias, were written later in Plato's career as an author, but described events that had happened very early on during his own youth, during the lifetime of his mentor, Socrates. In Plato's descriptions from memory of Socrates' discussion with Timaeus of Locri, Hermocrates and Critias, the grandfather of Critias of the Thirty Tyrants affair. According to the contents of this narrative, recited by Critias and transcribed by Plato decades later, the Greek lawmaker Solon, credited as the father of Athenian democracy, and whom lived from around 638 to around 558 BC had journeyed as a young man himself to Egypt in the city of Sais called Jo in the Egyptian and said by Herodotus to have been the tomb of Osiris within the Egyptian district of Sais in the fifth gnome of the canopic branch of the Nile River's western delta region Solon was initiated into a cult of Neath. The Egyptian goddess Nut was one of the nine deity pantheon, called by the Greeks the Ennead, and worshipped in Heliopolis, previously called Lunu by the indigenous Egyptians, and the land of On in the Tanakh, who explained to him the myth of Atlantis glossing over an already abridged and distorted interpretation by either Plato, by Timaeus, or by them both, of Pythagoreanism, assigning elements to the five regular solids, later called the Platonic solids, etc. Critias then rejoins the history of the once great island continent of Atlantis in the subsequent book, named for him by Plato. Critias explains that 9,000 years before then, or roughly 12,500 years before now, there had been a great war with the Atlanteans, who had invaded as far as Etruria and Middle Italy and Egypt, when the Athenians of the era led an alliance force that, though it disintegrated, provided them cover long enough to push the Atlanteans back from Tyrrhenia and Egypt. Critias then quickly adds that, at a later time, the entire island of Atlantis sank into the ocean in a single day and night. As Critias begins to quote the words of Zeus, whose wrath was vented on Atlantis, the account abruptly cuts off in mid-thought and is not picked up again by its author in subsequent writings. The most important detail of this entire narrative, however, which should not be overlooked, is that, speaking on behalf of Solon, Critias described how the 
commands of Poseidon were inscribed by the first kings on a pillar of oral calcum, which was situated in the middle of the island at the temple of Poseidon. A partial fragment from Plato's Republic, written around 380 BC, had found its way into the Nag Hammadi Library of 12 leather-bound papyrus leaf Coptic language codices recovered from Chenoboskian in Egypt, dating to no later than the 4th century AD. Surely the authors or scribes of four Enoch's various language translations at Qumran had also heard of Plato's Atlantis. Assuming the descriptions of the dates in all these materials, as we should, are merely conflations, and taking them all for simply myths is wisest. However, due to the global prevalence of the flood myth in ancient mythopoeic historical accounts, spanning across hundreds of different cultures, many separated from each other and isolated from the majority of the rest, human curiosity about this period of our past history persists. So, what comparisons can be made between these ancient sources about the pre-diluvial era? From Plato, we learn that the pre-diluvial Atlanteans carved their laws on a pillar of orichalcum, a supposedly indestructible material that has, nevertheless, managed to entirely vanish from Earth's surface by now. From the 13th degree of Scottish Rite Freemasonry, we learn that Enoch the Sethite, who also lived before the Flood, also carved laws into indestructible pillars after his own style, and left these above ground to mark the nearby secret location of his buried nine-chamber vault. We are further told in the Royal Arch degree that Enoch buried a cubic agate stone there with an embedded gold triangle carved with the true name of God. Finally, this degree confers this cube of agate was dug up from Enoch's original buried temple and transplanted to a location in a sacred vault beneath the Holy of Holies under the first temple, presumably on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. However, from current archaeological records, we are discovering increased evidence for a thriving Iron Age civilization spread across the Levant with central rulership that may have operated from one single location, Solomon's Temple in Jerusalem, but which was always meant to expand to include other temples, such as, in the Masonic tradition, of a Temple of Justice to be constructed over Enoch's vaults, and, possibly, ultimately, temples to the deities of foreign nations as well. The final recounting of matters in the ineffable degrees of the Scottish Rite asserts that the cube of agate remained buried in a sealed chamber beneath the Temple Mount from the time when Nebuchadnezzar raised the first temple in 587 BC until when the Knights Templar were formed in 1119 AD and agreed to help begin excavations of the area. But is Mount Zion even the location of Mount Moriah? Or were they digging in the wrong place all along? Locations other than Jerusalem that were active during the same era, such as Tel Berna, provide equally viable locations for such a temple. But if Solomon's temple, and thus Mount Moriah itself, are not located at Mount Zion in Jerusalem, then where else could they be? And, perhaps most importantly, from whom or where did Abraham acquire the Kaaba stone?
John Dee's smoking mirror is aptly named because, like a smoking gun, it offers direct and irrefutable evidentiary proof of John Dee's direct communication with and influenced by artifacts from the New World. That the mirror is Aztec in origin is beyond any doubt without question. However, the official version of events describing how it got into Dee's hands forwarded by the British Museum in London does seem unlikely. According to this explanation, the mirror once belonged to the Aztec chief Montezuma, representing his divine link with Tezcatlipoca, whose name itself meant smoking mirror. It was given by Montezuma too, or taken from him by, the Spanish conquistador Cortes, and returned home with him whence it was given over to the Holy Roman Emperor and King of Spain then, Charles V. According to theory, it then passed into Dee's hands when he visited Philip II of Spain, Charles V's heir. This event must have happened between 1530, when Cortes returned, and 1575, when the mirror is already known to have been in Dee's possession. This time frame is further complicated by the fact that Philip's reign only began in 1556. This means that the meeting between Dee and Philip could only have taken place between 1556 and 1575. If the meeting occurred after 1558, when Elizabeth I succeeded her Catholic sister, Mary Tudor, then it could only have been with D acting as espionage agent under Francis Walsingham on Her Majesty's Secret Service. It is known that D worked closely, as mentioned in his Enochian journals, with Adrian Gilbert, whose brother founded Newfoundland, that D studied with Gerardus Mercator and procured several globes of the earth from him before 1550 and the D taught several famous explorers the art of navigation and published a geographical treatise. D may have procured his obsidian mirror through Gilbert from Newfoundland, though its origin is almost certainly Aztec. In 1580, while presenting to Queen Elizabeth I her contrived entitlement to a British Empire, including lands in the New World. John Dee makes reference to the Welsh Prince Madoc, who, by the heritage of his father, Owain Gwynedd's mother, a Viking Irish princess, was, during Dee's time, thought to have followed Leif Erikson's route to the southwest of Eric the Red settlement in Greenland. Madoc is said to have taken ten ships of Welsh to North America, where they fought briefly with the Cherokee, before traveling up the Missouri River, where his people interbred with the native Mandans, who later merged with the Hidatsa. The Cherokee, indigenous to the mid-southeast, had been re-encountered in Dee's era as early as the mid-1500s by the DeSoto expedition. The Cherokee tribe name is derived from the Creek for people of a different speech. The Cherokee language is Iroquois, but differs slightly. In their own language, the Cherokee call themselves the Kitawa, or the people of Kitua, and are called Kitua also by the Algonquins. The Montauks pharaoh chiefs of the Algonquin and related tribes of the Northeast had been established at Long Island for 3,000 years before they sold Manhattan Island to the Dutch East Indies Trading Company to establish New Amsterdam in 1625. In 1609, Henry Hudson, searching for a new passage on behalf of the Dutch East Indies Company, explored Delaware Bay and the Hudson River Valley. Here, he encountered the confederation of 32 Lenni Lenape tribes, 
whose de facto rulers were the Mintucket tribe of eastern Long Island. The collected tribes of Long Island, known as the Metoac, were ruled by the four sons of Mangachsi, Long Knife, the sachem of the Mintucket family. These four were Pagaticut, ruling the Pogatikets, Winandak, ruling the Mintucket, Nawedino, ruling the Shinnecocks, and Mamowitz, ruling the Karkoogs. The Mintucket and Shinnecocks of eastern Long Island spoke an Algonquin dialect similar to the Pequot, Mohegan, Niantic, and Narangasset, while the other Metoac in central and western Rhode Island spoke a dialect similar to the Metabasic and Wappinger. In 1600, there were probably about 10,000 combined Metoac people living in the Long Island, Delaware Bay, and Hudson River Valley area. Although not officially first written down until the early 1800s by the multilingual Cherokee Sequoia, when, from 1809 to 1821, he invented the talking leaves syllabary, certain letters from this Cherokee syllabary seem, to some scholars, to mimic some of those developed as Enochian letters in late 1581 and early 1582 by John D. and his scrying partner, Edward Kelly. Because the Cherokee syllabary was written down around 360 years after the invention of the Enochian alphabet by D. and Kelly, and was done so by a Cherokee man, whom would have presumably had no knowledge of D. and Kelly's work, it remains an anomaly why these certain letters would seem logographically similar. From all depictions of John Dee contrived throughout his lifetime, we can quite clearly see one feature in common marks all as being unique to the man himself, and that is his wandering or strabismic left eye. This condition is called, presently, exotropia defined as the outward deviation of an eye which may occur while fixating on distant objects, nearby objects, or both. Most exotropia is intermittent. The eye deviation occurs only some of the time. However, it can also be a permanent condition, although in such cases it should not be confused with amblyopia, wherein the deviated eye also has decreased capacity for sight. If symptoms of exotropia occur prior to the age of six, the brain cells can rematch the double vision this effect produces, and this is called anomalous retinal correspondence. If the deviation occurs intermittently, it can occur either when looking at objects at a distance 20 feet or more, or when looking at objects close up, 16 inches or closer. If it occurs when looking at distant objects, bifocals may treat the effect cosmetically. However, if the exotropia occurs when looking at objects close up, as was almost certainly true in Dr. D's case, the effect is called convergence insufficiency and can result in diplopia, double vision, headaches, difficulty focusing, dizziness, as well as blurry eyesight. Although strabismus is thought to be caused primarily due to a genetic mutation, it can also come about through injury to the brain. Catalogued as sphere number five, crystal ball in Sphari, the Oxford newsletter of the Museum of History and Science. Dr. D's six centimeter diameter quartz sphere 
was used as a showstone in his scrying exercises with Edward Kelly. It is not now known if the composition of this crystal ball is alpha quartz, the more common kind, or beta quartz, which has higher symmetry, is less dense, and has a slightly lower specific gravity. However, it is now known alpha quartz can be heated into beta quartz and then cooled back down again into its original state. D's orb itself appears to be smoky quartz, a variety of silicate found in Scotland and the Swiss Alps during D's lifetime, although he claims in his journals, Action 24, Lieber 4, that the showstone was given to him by the angels with whom he communicated. It is known that, in 1552, D and Gerolamo Cardano met in London and, it is possible, procured Dee's infamous smoking mirror from the Society of the New Art there. Operating out of Limehouse in London's East End under Sir Humphrey Gilbert. Although no direct historical record of a brother exists, one Adrian Gilbert alleged half-brother of Sir Humphrey, is mentioned in Dee's diaries as being a close associate from at least this time on. According to the Limehouse legends of this society of the new art, it was formed when Martin Frobisher, inspired by Gilbert's advocation of opening a northwest passage between Europe and North America, sailed to Baffin Island between Greenland and Canada, from whence he returned with a mysterious black rock, which Frobisher himself, Humphrey, and or Dr. Adrian Gilbert, Lord Burley, better known as William Cecil, and the Earl of Leicester, better known as Robert Dudley, then attempted to transmute into gold. While at Limehouse working with the Society of the New Art in 1552, John Dee would have been only 25 years old, still five years the senior of Robert Dudley, but not yet the wizened counselor of royalty he would become later in life. However, since we have no depictions of Dee from prior to this period in his life, we cannot ascertain if his eye condition was inherent from birth or acquired due to injury at some point later on during his life. If the effect occurred due to injury, it should not be ruled out that such could have occurred while attempting to superheat either the quartz sphere, the smoking mirror, or both at Limehouse on the River Thames. On March 10th, 1582, John Dee sat for their first scrying session with Edward Kelly. Scrying, such as the hydromancy of Nostradamus, the French Catholic seer, an early contemporary to the lifetime of John Dee, was known in Dee's time to be an ancient art, presumably tracing back to an Egyptian magician named Nephates, cognate to the legendary Greek Narcissus. Dee and Kelly's method of scrying was crystal gazing and focused on Dee's six centimeter diameter crystal ball. Beginning with this first sitting in 1582, Dee and Kelly established what has come to be known since as Enochian magic. It should be strongly noted by any modern practitioner of Enochian magic that there are, in fact, two distinct and separate forms of it developed by Dee and Kelly. The first is the so-called Benorum, or heptarchical system, and this form is what Dee and Kelly used to derive the second, properly Enochian, system of sigils, 
watchtowers, heirs, evocations, etc. While modern practice preserves much of the latter, it seems to see no further use in study of the Benorum method for deriving the properly Enochian system. The method D and Kelly used to communicate with the angels, which Kelly had, at first, seen easily enough through D's showstone alone, ultimately involved seven specific ritual implements. One, the sacred showstone itself. Two, the table of practice, made of sweet wood or laurel, having four legs and a square top. Three, the seven ensigns of creation, an encrypted form of Dies Benorum. Four, the Sigillium Dei Emeth, engraved on perfect wax, nine inches in diameter and an inch and a half thick, as well as on four smaller engraved wax seals to be placed beneath the feet of the table of practice. Five, 49 seals of the Benorum princes placed beneath the feet of the operators. Six, an Enochian ring of Solomon engraved with the name Pele to be worn by D. And finally, seven, the second or holy layman, an as of yet undeciphered array of Enochian letters. D and Kelly seem to have, wittingly or not, created the Benorum or Heptarchical system as a form of double blind to reduce noise and filter out inaccuracies in the scrying process. In this phase of their workings, Kelly would scry and D transcribe only one letter at a time as they composed the Enochian evocations. The seven ensigns of creation were placed on top of the table of practice, and the 49 seals of the Benorum princes were placed beneath the scryer's feet. Each letter location on the seven ensigns related to one of the 49 seals of the Benorum princes, and each of these 49 seals related, in turn, to one of 49 more ministers, each with its own combination of seven letters, all in such a manner that, by Kelly identifying one letter location on the seven ensigns, D could cross-reference this to a specific letter among the names of the Benorum ministers, and thus each letter, one by one, was spelt out in the Enochian language through them. Following this method, D and Kelly composed 18 evocations, and a single final evocation to the 30 Enochian heirs, and together compiled these as the 48 angelic keys. These included along with an oration to God to be spoken three times a day, composed by D, a brief invocation to the Benorum princes, and an abbreviated tablature of which Benorum prince is to be venerated on what day of the week, etc comprised the entirety of the ritual work intended for the properly Enochian section derived by D and Kelly, employing the Benorum as a double-blind method. Using the first 18 keys, with the substitution of each of 91 names called by D the parts of the earth imposed by God, and the key of the 30 heirs, D and Kelly drafted the four watchtowers of 156 square cells each, 12 vertical by 13 horizontal, and placed the parts of earth imposed by God 
each a seven letter name, as sigils connecting letters in each of these more than 624 total cells. According to this method, the 30 heirs, each containing three such seven letter sigils, overlap the four watchtowers, such that each sigil on the surface of each watchtower could occupy multiple levels on the spherical model of the 30 heirs. However, whether all of this was, as D claimed, divinely inspired, or whether D was simply insane, is a matter of ongoing historical dispute, and since with each passing second we get further away from his time period, we are perpetually receding from discovering the truth of this matter. If D's work was divinely inspired, one would expect it to have flawless internal consistency and perfect interior continuity. But, as any student of D's system knows, it does not. The 91 parts of the earth contain some letters in names that fall in the black cross section between the four watchtowers and thus are off the map of their 12 by 13 cells. One other seven-letter name, Sigil, Lax Dizzy, appears on this map, but perhaps because it is a proximal duplicate for another name, Laz Dixie, is excluded by D from all his lists of these 91, which are, in fact, thus actually 92. The lowest error Tex has four parts of the earth associated with it, while the remaining 29 heirs have three each. Many anomalies such as these persist throughout the Enochian material generated by D. N. Kelly, and the real purpose and use for this entire system of magic remains undeciphered to this day. Ultimately, not only is D's derivation of the Enochian magic system an anomaly, but so is everything else about this system of magic as well, including, if any, its originally intended function. In 1556, D proposed the founding of a national English library to Queen Mary but his plan was not implemented. In consequence, D amassed the largest library in England at the time using his personal funds consisting of at least 3,000 printed volumes and a large number of manuscripts. The library was pilfered during D's six-year trip to the European continent between 1583 and 1589 and Dee was forced to sell many more volumes upon his return due to penury. After his death in 1608 or 1609, the still considerable remnants of the vaunted library were ransacked until nothing remained. During Dee's long trip to the continent, he sought to supernaturally contact angels through the services of his scryer, Edward Kelly. On the subject of the Book of Soiga, D claimed to have questioned the angel Uriel about the significance of the book and asked for guidance. The reply that D received was that the book had been revealed to Adam in paradise by angels and could be interpreted by the archangel Michael. The Book of Soiga, also titled Alderaia, is a 16th century Latin treatise on magic, one copy of which is known to have been possessed by the Elizabethan scholar John Dee. After Dee's death, the book was thought to be lost until 1994, when two manuscripts were located in the British Library, Sloan Manuscript 8, and the Bodleian Library, 
Bodley Manuscript 908 under the title Aldaria Sivi Soiga Vokor by D. Scholar Deborah Harkness. The Sloan 8 version is also described as Tractatus Astrologico Magicus, though both versions differ only slightly. Jim Reed's notes that the Bodley 908 manuscript consists of 197 leaves, including Liber Alderia, 95 leaves, Liber Radiorum, 65 leaves, and Liber Decimus Septimus, 2 leaves, as well as a number of shorter and unnamed works, totaling approximately 10 leaves. The final 18 leaves of the manuscript contain 36 tables of letters. The Sloan 8 manuscript consists of 147 leaves, mostly identical to the Bodley manuscript, with the exception that the tables of letters appear on 36 leaves and the Liber Radiorum is presented in a two-leaf summarized version. After Harkness rediscovered the two copies of the book, Jim Reads uncovered the mathematical formula used to construct the tables, starting with the seed word given for each table, and identified errors of various types made by the manuscript's scribes. He showed that a subset of the errors were common to the two copies, suggesting that they were derived from a common ancestor which contained that subset of errors and thus was presumably itself a copy of another work. Although Reeds deciphered the construction algorithm and the code words used in crafting the tables, the actual content and significance of the tables remains mysterious. He writes, The treatise in the Book of Soiga which discusses the tables, Liber Radiorum, has a series of paragraphs mentioning the code words for 23 of the tables, together with number sequences which stand in unknown relation to the words. In cryptography, a Caesar cipher, also known as Caesar cipher, the shift cipher, Caesar's code, or Caesar shift, is one of the simplest and most widely known encryption techniques. It is a type of substitution cipher in which each letter in the plain text is replaced by a letter some fixed number of positions down the alphabet. For example, with a left shift of 3, D would be replaced by A, E would become B, and so on. The method is named after Julius Caesar, who used it in his private correspondence. A construction of two rotating disks with the Caesar cipher can be used to encrypt or decrypt the code. Caesar cipher is a simple substitution based on the sliding of a single ordinary alphabet with fixed key. Once the equivalent of a letter is discovered, all the equivalent cipher letters are known. With the Alberti cipher disk, there are two mixed alphabets, and the key varies continuously during encryption. Therefore, the discovery of a single letter does not permit further progress. Frequency analysis is also impossible because the same letter is always enciphered differently. The Visionary cipher is based on a single, ordinary alphabet like that of Caesar and is easily solved after discovering its fixed period by means of the Kasiki exam. This is not possible with Alberti. The Alberti cipher disk, also called formula, is a cipher disk which was described by Leon Battista Alberti in his treatise De Cifris of 1467. The device embodies the first example of a polyalphabetic substitution with mixed alphabets and variable period and is made up of two concentric disks. The larger one is called stabilis, stationary or fixed. The smaller one is called mobilis, movable. 
The circumference of each disc is divided into 24 equal cells. The outer ring contains one uppercase alphabet for plain text, and the inner ring has a lowercase mixed alphabet for cipher text. The outer ring also includes the numbers 1 to 4 for the super encipherment of a code book containing 336 phrases with assigned numerical values. In cryptography, the tabula recta is a square table of alphabets, each row of which is made by shifting the previous one to the left. The term was invented by the German author and monk Johann Trithemius in 1508 and used in his book Polygraphia, which is credited with being the first published book on cryptology. Trithemius used the tabula recta to define a polyalphabetic cipher, which was equivalent to Leon Battista Alberti's cipher disk, except that the alphabets are not mixed. The tabula recta is often referred to in discussing pre-computer ciphers, including the Visionaire cipher and Blaise de Visionaire's less well-known autokey cipher. All polyalphabetic ciphers based on Caesar ciphers can be described in terms of the tabula recta. It uses a letter square with the 26 letters of the alphabet following 26 rows of additional letters, each shifted once to the left. This creates 26 different Caesar ciphers. This method removes the letter frequencies from the cipher text, making it appear as a random string or block of data. However, if a person is aware that this method is being used, it becomes easy to break. The cipher is vulnerable to attack because it lacks a key, which is said to break Kirchhoff's principle, a rule of cryptology. In 1550, Girolamo Cardano, 1501-1576, known in French as Jérôme Cardan, proposed a simple grid for writing hidden messages. He intended to cloak his messages inside an ordinary letter so that the whole would not appear to be a cipher at all. Such a disguised message is considered to be an example of steganography, which is a sub-branch of general cryptography. But the name Cardon was applied to grills that may not have been Cardon's invention, and so Cardon is a generic name for cardboard grill ciphers. In cryptography, a one-time pad OTP is an encryption technique that cannot be cracked if used correctly. In this technique, a plain text is paired with a random secret key or pad. Then each bit or character of the plain text is encrypted by combining it with the corresponding bit or character from the pad using modular addition. If the key is truly random, is at least as long as the plain text, is never refused in whole or in part, and is kept completely secret, then the resulting ciphertext will be impossible to decrypt or break. The Voynich Manuscript is an illustrated codex handwritten in an unknown writing system. The vellum in the book pages has been carbon dated to the early 15th century, between 1404 and 1438, and may have been composed in northern Italy during the Italian Renaissance. Because the text cannot be read, the illustrations are conventionally used to divide most of the manuscript into six different sections. Each section is typified by illustrations with different styles and supposed subject matter, except for the last section, in which the only drawings are small stars in the margin. Following are the sections and their conventional names. Herbal. Each page displays one or two plants and a few paragraphs of text, a format typical of European herbals of the time. 
Some parts of these drawings are larger and cleaner copies of sketches seen in the pharmaceutical section. None of the plants depicted are unambiguously identifiable. Astronomical contains circular diagrams, some of them with suns, moons, and stars, suggestive of astronomy or astrology. One series of twelve diagrams depicts conventional symbols of the zodiac constellations. Two fish for Pisces, a bull for Taurus, a hunter with crossbow for Sagittarius, etc. Each of these has thirty female figures arranged in two or more concentric bands. Most of the females are at least partly naked, and each holds what appears to be a labeled star or is shown with the star attached by what could be a tether or cord of some kind to either arm. The last two pages of this section, Aquarius and Capricornus, roughly January and February, were lost, while Aries and Taurus are split into four paired diagrams with 15 women and 15 stars each. Some of these diagrams are on fold-out pages, Biological. A dense, continuous text interspersed with figures, mostly showing small naked women, some wearing crowns, bathed in pools or tubs, connected by an elaborate network of pipes. Cosmological. More circular diagrams, but of an obscure nature. This section also has foldouts. One of them spans six pages and contains a map or diagram with nine islands or rosettes connected by causeways and containing castles as well as what might be a volcano. Pharmaceutical. Many labeled drawings of isolated plant parts, roots, leaves, etc., objects resembling apothecary jars ranging in style from the mundane to the fantastical, and a few text paragraphs. Recipes Full pages of text, broken into many short paragraphs, each marked with a star in the left margin. One theory holds that the text of the Voynich manuscript is mostly meaningless, but contains meaningful information hidden in inconspicuous details, e.g. the second letter of every word, or the number of letters in each line. This technique, called steganographia, is very old and was described by Johann Trithemius in 1499, though it has been speculated that the plain text was to be extracted by a cardan grill of some sort. This seems somewhat unlikely because the words and letters are not arranged on anything like a regular grid. Still, steganographic claims are hard to prove or disprove, since stego text can be arbitrarily hard to find. The cipher manuscripts are a collection of 56 folios containing the structural outline of a series of magical initiation rituals. The cipher manuscripts are the original source upon which the rituals and the knowledge lectures of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn were based. William Wynne Westcott, a London deputy coroner, member of the SRIA and one of the founders of the Golden Dawn, claimed to have received the manuscripts through Reverend A.F.A. Woodford, who was a colleague of noted Masonic scholar Kenneth Mackenzie. The papers were to have been secured by Westcott after Mackenzie's death in 1886. Among the belongings of Mackenzie's mentor, the late Frederick Hockley. By September, 
1887, they were decoded by Westcott. The folios are drawn in black ink on cotton paper, watermarked 1809. The text is plain English, written from right to left, in a substitution cryptogram known as the Trithemius cipher, attributed to Johann Trithemius, a medieval German abbot. Numerals are substituted by Hebrew letters, Aleph equals 1, Beth equals 2, etc. The manuscripts also contained an address of an aged adept named Fraulein Anna Springle in Germany, to whom Westcott wrote, inquiring about the contents of the papers. Miss Springle responded, and after accepting the requests of Westcott and his partner and fellow Mason Samuel Little McGregor Mathers, whom had helped translate the text, issued them a charter to operate a lodge of the order in England. Using the cipher manuscripts, Mackenzie allegedly founded the Society of Eight as the first phase of what was to later become the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Thus, Mackenzie's group was Temple Number One, and Frederick Hockley, who was alleged to be a member of the Society of Eight, founded Temple Number Two. When Isis Urania was founded, it was numbered as number three. There are letters by Mackenzie that indicate the Society of Eight existed, but nothing that describes what they actually taught or practiced. The ciphers contain the outlines of a series of graded rituals and the syllabus for a course of instruction in Kobala and Hermetic magic, including astrology, tarot, geomancy, and alchemy. The occult materials in the manuscripts are a compendium of the classical magical theory and symbolism known in the Western world up until the middle of the 19th century, combined to create an encompassing model of the Western mystery tradition and arranged into a syllabus of a graded course of instruction in magical symbolism. Hermeticism, alchemy, Kabbalah, astrology, and Tarot were certainly not unknown to 19th century scholars of the magical arts. The cipher is a compendium of previously known magical traditions. Much of the hierarchical structure for the Golden Dawn came from the Societies Rosicruciana in Anglia, which was itself derived from the Order of the Golden and Rosy Cross. The Societas Rosicruciana in Anglia, Rosicrucian Society of England, is a Masonic, esoteric, Christian order formed by Robert Wentworth Little and Kenneth Mackenzie in 1865. The Order of the Golden and Rosy Cross Orden des Gold und Rosenkranz, also the Fraternity of the Golden and Rosy Cross, was a German Rosicrucian organization founded in the 1750s by a Freemason and alchemist, Hermann Fichtuld. The discussions between Rus and Kellner did not lead to any positive results at the time. Because Rus was very busy with the revival of the Order of Illuminati, along with his associate Leopold Engel, 1858-1931, of Dresden, Kellner did not approve of the revived Illuminati Order, nor of Engel. According to Rus, upon his final separation with Engel in June 1902, Kellner contacted him and the two agreed to proceed with the establishment of Ordo Templi Orientis by seeking authorizations to work the various rites of high-grade masonry. 
Roos and Kellner together prepared a brief manifesto for their order in 1903, which was published the next year in the Oriflamme. Kellner died on June 7, 1905. Carl Kellner and Patial Beverly Randolph were members. In Theodore Roos' 1917 OTO Constitution, it states in Article 1, Section 1, Under the style and title, Ancient Order of Oriental Templars, an organization formerly known as the Hermetic Brotherhood of Light, has been reorganized and reconstituted. This reconstituted association is an international organization and is here and after referred to as the OTO. The Order's teachings drew heavily from the magico-sexual theories of Patial Beverly Randolph. Prior to the rise of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn in 1888, the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor was the only order that taught practical occultism in the Western mystery tradition. Among its members were a number of occultists, spiritualists, and theosophists. Initial relations between the order and the Theosophical Society were cordial, with most members of the order also prominent members of the TS. Later there was a falling out, as the order was opposed to the Eastern-based teachings of the later Blavatsky. Davidson considered that Blavatsky had fallen under the influence of, quote, a greatly inferior order belonging to the Buddhist cult, end quote. Conversely, the conviction in 1886 of the secretary of the order, Thomas Henry Burgoyne, for fraud, was claimed by the Theosophists to show the immorality of the order. The early history of OTO is difficult to trace reliably. It originated in Germany or Austria between 1895 and 1906. Its apparent founder was Karl Kellner, a wealthy Austrian industrialist in 1895, although nothing verifiable is known of the order until 1904. Theodore Roos, 1855 to 1923, collaborated with Kellner in creating OTO and succeeded him as head of OTO after Kellner's death. Under Roos, charters were given to occult brotherhoods in France, Denmark, Switzerland, the USA, and Austria. There were nine degrees, of which the first six were Masonic. In 1902, Roos, along with Franz Hartmann, and Henry Klein purchased the right to perform the rites of Memphis and Mizraim of Freemasonry, the authority of which was confirmed in 1904 and again in 1905. Although these rites are considered to be irregular, they, along with the Swedenborg Rite, form the core of the newly established order. From as early as 1738, one can find traces of the rite of Memphis and Mizraim, filled with alchemical, occult, and Egyptian references, with a structure of 90 degrees. Joseph Balsamo, called Cogliostro, a key character of his time, gave the rite the impulse necessary for its development. Very close to the Grand Master of the Order of the Knights of Malta, Manuel Pinto de Fonseca, Cogliostro founded the Rite of High Egyptian Masonry in 1784. Between 1767 and 1775, 
he received the Arcana Arcanorum, which are three very high hermetic degrees, from Sir Knight Luigi de Aquino, the brother of the National Grand Master of Neapolitan Masonry. In 1788, he introduced them into the rite of Mizraim and gave a patent to this rite. It developed quickly in Milan, Genoa, and Naples. In 1803, it was introduced by Joseph, Michel, and Mar Bedarid. During this period of time, the right recruited not only aristocrats, but Bonapartists and Republicans, and sometimes even revolutionary Carbonari. It was forbidden in 1817, following the incident of the four sergeants of La Rochelle and the uneasiness caused by the Carbonari. Lodges became meeting places for the opponents to the regime, which led to the decline of the right, and around 1890, the last masons of the right regrouped in the only remaining lodge, Arc and Chiel. The four sergeants of La Rochelle, Boris, Goubain, Pomier, and Raoul, were guillotined in Paris in 1822. Their great courage initiated a liberal campaign and they became legendary. They became particularly popular figures amongst the Carbonari in Italy. The flag used by the four sergeants was once owned by Prince Jerome Bonaparte. It is a French tricolor bearing the slogans Constitution and Napoleon II on one side, and Honor and Fatherland on the other. The flag was used by the Carbonari Ventis between 1821 and 1822. It was seen during the plot of the 29th Line Regiment in Belfort, then in Paris, and finally in La Rochelle where it was preserved. It passed through the hands of the Lieutenant Colonel Caron, then to Major du Bourgeois, then to Marquis d'Andon, who finally offered it to Prince Napoleon in 1888. The Swedenborg Rite or Rite of Swedenborg, was a fraternal order modeled on Freemasonry and based upon the teachings of Emanuel Swedenborg. It comprised six degrees, Apprentice, Fellow Craft, Master Neophyte, Illuminated Theosophite, Blue Brother, and Red Brother. It was created in Avignon in 1773 by the Marquis de Thorn. It was initially a political organization whose aims were to bring Freemasonry into disrepute, although the political ideology was eventually discarded from the right. This version of the Swedenborg right died out within a decade of its founding. Starting in the 1870s, the right was resurrected as a hermetic organization. This version faded out sometime around 1908. The rite is now extinct, but influenced the development of other groups, such as Ordo Templi Orientis. A passage from The Secret Inner Order Rituals of the OTO. 1. Take a suitable woman willing to aid thee in this work. Explain to her fully the precautions to be taken and the manner of life necessary. Let her horoscope be, if possible, suited to the nature of the homunculus proposed, as to have an incarnate spirit of benevolence. Let Jupiter be rising in Pisces, with good aspects of soul, Venus and Luna, and with no notable contrary dispositions, or so far as may be possible. 2. Take now a man suitable, if convenient, thyself, or some other brother initiate of the Gnosis, and so far as may be, 
let his horoscope also harmonize with the nature of the work. 3. Let the man and woman copulate continuously, but especially at times astrologically favorable to thy working, and that in a ceremonial manner in a prepared temple, whose particular arrangement and decoration is also suitable to thy work, and let them will ardently and constantly the success of thy work, denying all other desires. Thus proceed until impregnation results. In the work Moonchild, numerous acquaintances of the author, Aleister Crowley, appear as thinly disguised fictional characters. Crowley portrays McGregor Mathers as the primary villain, including him as the character named SRMD, using the abbreviation of Mather's magical name. Arthur Edward Waite appears as a villain named Arthwaite, and the unseen head of the inner circle of which SRMD was a m member, A.B., is theosophist Annie Besant. Among Crowley's friends and allies, Alan Bennett appears as Mahatera Fang, Isadora Duncan appears as Lavinia King, and Mary d'Est as Lisa Le Gerfria. Cyril Gray is Crowley himself, while Simon If is either an idealized version of an older and wiser Crowley or his friend Alan Bennett. A year or so before the beginning of World War I, a young woman named Lisa Laguerre of Free is seduced by a white magician, Cyril Gray, and persuaded into helping him in a magical battle with the black magician and his black lodge. Gray is attempting to raise the level of his force by impregnating the girl with the soul of an ethereal being, the moon child. To achieve this, she will have to be kept in a secluded environment, and many preparatory magical rituals will be carried out. The black magician Douglas is bent on destroying Gray's plan. However, Gray's ultimate motives may not be what they appear. The Moonchild rituals are carried out in southern Italy, but the occult organizations are based in Paris and England. At the end of the book, the war breaks out and the white magicians support the Allies, while the black magicians support the Central Powers. The Babylon Working was a series of magic ceremonies or rituals commenced on March 2, 1946, by Jack Parsons, essentially designed to manifest an individual incarnation of the archetypal divine feminine called Babylon as well as to catalyze the reification of that force as it exists latently in every man and woman. During the ceremony, L. Ron Hubbard acted as a scribe, noting the results of the magical workings. When Parson declared that the first of the series of rituals was complete and successful, he almost immediately met Marjorie Cameron in his own home and regarded her as the creation of the ritual, considered her his scarlet woman, and soon began the next stage of the series, an attempt to conceive a child through sexual magical workings. Although no child was conceived, this did not affect the result of the ritual to that point. Parsons and Cameron soon married. The rituals performed drew largely upon the Enochian magical system devised by Dr. John D. and Sir Edward Kelly. They also drew heavily from rituals and sex magic described by Aleister Crowley, who in turn borrowed many aspects of his Babylon from combining the Babylonian goddess Ishtar with the figure of Mystery Babylon, the great whore in the biblical book of Revelation. A brief text entitled The Book of Babylon, or Liber 49, was written by Jack Parsons as a transmission from the goddess of or force called Babylon, 
received by him during the Babylon working. Parsons said that Liber 49 constituted a fourth chapter of Liber al Vel Legis, the Book of the Law, the holy text of Thelema. In the Gematria of Hermetic Kabbalah, Aleister Crowley equated the number 156 with Babylon, equating the letter O with the Hebrew letter Ayin, which has the value 70. In Enochian, Babylon means wicked. Babylon means a harlot. The Vision and the Voice Liber 418 Chronicles the Mystical Journey of Aleister Crowley 1875-1947 as he explored the 30 Enochian ethers, originally developed by Dr. John D. and Edward Kelly in the 16th century. These visions took place at two times, in 1900 during his stay in Mexico, and later in 1909 in Algeria in the company of poet Victor Benjamin Newberg. Of all his works, Crowley considered this book to be second in importance behind the Book of the Law, the text that established his religious and philosophical system of Thelema in 1904. The vision and the voice is the source of many of the central spiritual doctrines of Thelema, especially in the visions of Babylon and her consort Chaos, the All-Father as well as an account of how an individual might cross the abyss, thereby assuming the title of Master of the Temple and taking a place in the City of the Pyramids under the Night of Pan. Crowley describes the method of this work's transmission in its introduction thus. The method of obtaining the vision and the voice was as follows. The seer had with him a great golden topaz, set in a calvary cross of six squares, made of wood and painted vermilion, which was engraved with a Greek cross of five squares, charged with a rose of forty-nine petals. He held this as a rule in his hand. After choosing a spot where he was not likely to be disturbed, he would take this stone and recite the Enochian call, and after satisfying himself that the forces invoked were actually present, made the topaz play a part not unlike that of the looking glass in the case of Alice. He would then describe what he saw and repeat what he heard, and Frater O.V., the scribe, would write down his words and incidentally observe any phenomena which struck him as peculiar. By drafting these thirty Enochian heirs, Crowley brought the total number of Enochian evocations up from D's sum of eighteen plus one, the last being for the thirty heirs all-inclusive, to the new aeon sum of forty-nine, a fact which would not have gone unnoticed by Crowley, who further writes in the introduction about how D and Kelly had procured their original Enochian system. D would have one or more of these tables, as a rule, 49 by 49, some full, others lettered only on alternate squares, before him on a writing table. Kelly would sit at what they called the holy table and gaze into a showstone in which he would see an angel who would point with a wand to letters on one of these charts in succession. Kelly would report, for example, he points to column 6, rank 31, and so on, apparently not mentioning the letter which D found and wrote down from the table before him. When the angel had finished, the message was rewritten backwards. It should also be noted by the student of Enochian magic that, although translated by Crowley, 
between 1901 when he began work on the Goetic Lesser Key of Solomon and 1916 when it was published. The eleven conjurations therein, including two curses given in the Enochian language developed by Dean Kelly in the 1500s, are not originally Enochian in their content. These appear to be translations of portions of the Goetia itself into Enochian, however should be considered no more authentically Enochian than the Satanic Bible by Anton LaVey, which also uses an Enochian evocation, however substitutes the name Satan for the names of the spirits to be invoked. If Crowley's Enochian language translations of segments from Goetia were included in the corpus of authentically Enochian evocations, defined as being given in the Enochian language of Dean Kelly, then the total sum of all these would be around 60 different calls. Firstly, we must define what is meant by the term angel. Traditionally, an angel was a messenger sent by God. These could come in almost any form imaginable, from three strange visitors to a bush that was burning but was not consumed, or from wheels within wheels to a reed fence whispering a name, and could bring accompanying symptoms, including many alike those arising from exposure to radioactive elements, and visions along with them, ranging from seeing a ladder to heaven, to a harlot riding atop a great beast with seven heads and ten horns. In ancient theist scriptures, all such visions were associated with dreams, fevers, and drugs, and this much is attested to even in monotheist apocrypha, such as the Essene Book of Giants and the Coptic Christian Gospel, the Book of Enoch, both of which describe dreams as being messages sent to us by God, decipherable only by those who best understand the messenger. Thus, dream interpretation has played an important role in the history of Western monotheism and occurs often in its mythological scriptures. In Western monotheist cosmology, the different forms of angelic appearance listed throughout the Bible are cataloged according to seven different choirs, orders or types, occupying seven different heavens, orbital spheres, ruled over by seven different archangels associated with the five nearest planets with Earth's moon and with the sun. Thus, the description of cherubs as winged males derives from the association of the choir of cherubim with the winged and bird-masked priests of the seven Apkalu sages sent by the Anunnaki, gods in ancient Sumer, while the concept of a flaming serpent form of angel is derived from the seraphim choir, who are symbolized in ancient art as shooting stars, i.e. comets and meteors. Both birds and celestial events having already long been seen as omens, or portents foretelling future changes. While simple augury, such as by examining the contents of bird entrails, is prehistoric in origin, the far more complex method of theurgy, or angel summoning, 
using ritual magic may have been developed as recently as the European Dark Ages. In this, each of the seven archangels is assigned a day of the week, and each planetary ruler associated with these is then, in turn, assigned certain hours of day and night at which summoning the associated archangel or any of its affiliated lesser messenger angels is appropriate. This method of ritual timing by the planetary tables of the hours was used alchemically, for example, to infuse seven kinds of metal with these seven types of spiritual essence in making different types of superstitious amulets and talismans. If these relics are, indeed, thus infused with any more than merely a psychosomatic or placebo effect, remains as of yet untested by modern science. Next, to determine the nature of the angels supposedly summoned by the theurgy invented or discovered by John D. and Edward Kelly in the late 1500s A.D., we must examine D.'s own beliefs about them, the condition of D.'s mental fitness to judge, and lastly, we must judge D.'s angels objectively by the light of popular morality today. D. called the angels he and Kelly communicated with Enochian because, he wrote, they told him they were the angels known to the patriarch Enoch. Whether or not D. believed this statement by them, or any they made to him subsequently, is irrelevant besides the fact that, from thence onward, he loyally transcribed all their meetings and conversations, and carried out all their requests and demands. Being anal retentively fastidious, as his works prove, D. followed through on his end even to a fault. To scientifically test the veracity of his vision's claims, D. staked his own wife, and, ultimately, his fate later in life did reflect that choice. In short, it is safe to say that, to the same extent D. believed these angels truly real, that belief drove him into paranoid schizophrenic senility. Some latter-day proponents may raise the imperfect vessel argument, but by comparison to the moral sensibilities of modern post-Puritan Western monotheists, it should not be arguable that the angels' later requests of D. were made in poor taste, at least, if not having been an outright fraud perpetrated on the elderly D. by a sadistic, predatory Kelly. To put it bluntly, D. opened a portal to an undiscovered country inside the human psyche, and, in his altruism, attempted to bring his own sense of human order into it. The result is the Enochian system. Now, today, we may review such apocryphal gospels as the Book of Enoch and the Book of Giants and learn much more than ever Dr. D. had realized about the angels who were supposedly known to Enoch. In the book of Enoch, he is visited by one of the seven archangels, whom shows him the fate of the Anunnaki, or fallen rebel angels, that they are to be hung in midair above a boiling, sulfurous lake inside a hidden cave. Thus, there are two types of angels that were known to the patriarch Enoch, the good archangels and the evil, fallen Anunnaki, or rebel angels. In the canonical Book of Genesis, it is written that these rebel angels had transgressed the will of God by breeding with the wives of men and begetting offspring by them, a race of giants and heroes like the titans of old. Then, to exterminate these giants, 
sometimes called the Nephilim. God sent the deluge, the mythic world flood, and this event erased them from existence. In the Book of the Watchers chapter of the Book of Enoch, it describes in detail how these rebel angels taught early people the basic arts of civilization, including how to make clothing, jewelry, cosmetics, incense and oils, medicines and poisons, and how to smelt metals, among many other things. The legend continues that, while these Anunnaki rebel angels became demons in hell, the Nephilim giants themselves became the jinn, or genies, non-corporeal ghosts that may be summoned by, and even trapped in, certain amulets and talismans. It was supposedly these genie that King Solomon called upon to help construct the first temple to the monotheist's god ever erected, and, thus, the 72 names and sigils of the Goetia, or Lesser Key, Grimoire of King Solomon, whether authentic to him or from a later era and elsewhere, also refer to these same genies, or ghosts, of antediluvian giants. So the question becomes, finally, were the angels summoned by Dee and Kelly, if truly Enochian in origin, the good archangels, the evil Anunnaki, neither, or both? The Four Watchtowers Tablet of John Dee's Ritual Magic Enochian System remains today one of the most important, although also one of the most misunderstood, documents on astrophysics and number theory ever written by the hand of any human being. It is, quite obviously, encrypted containing a series of 92 sigils of seven-letter cells each on a layman, with a total of 675 cells, 624 if excluding the black cross. But this means it can also be deciphered and its authentic meaning revealed. So let us decrypt D's Enochian system first by removing its Enochian alphabet and denuding the four watchtowers of any trace thereof. Then what remains left over is just an empty grid, so similar to the later Cartesian coordinate grid, both being divided into quadrants by a black cross of one vertical and one horizontal bar. The sole difference is, in D's model, each quadrant is composed of 12 vertical columns and 13 horizontal rows, creating a total of 156 cells per each quadrant. This is the skeletal structure of John D's entire Enochian system. The reason each quadrant is 12 columns wide by 13 rows tall is because each quadrant or watchtower in D's model is also divided within itself into four smaller sub-angles or four quadrants within each quadrant by a deacon cross of six by six cells. Each sub-angle quadrant consists of 30 cells and the deacon crosses that divide between them all are comprised of 36 cells apiece. Thus there are four deacon crosses, one per each watchtower quadrant, for a total of 144 cells, and there are four sub-angles per each watchtower quadrant 
for a total of 120 cells per watchtower quadrant, and a total of 480 sub-angle cells for the whole model, where 144 plus 480 equals 624 total. However, by using this uneven and apparently imbalanced ratio of six rows by five columns per each sub-angle, Dee founded, or found, a system firmly rooted to the fertile ground of number theory, because 144, the sum of all cells for the four deacon crosses, is not only six times 24, or 12 squared, but it is also the twelfth iteration, including zero, occurring on the Fibonacci sequence of additive sums that forms the famous phi ratio spiral. Thus, zero, one, one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen, twenty-one, thirty-four, fifty-five, eighty-nine, one forty-four, etc. 144. The sum of all the cells in the four deacon crosses is 12 times 12. And 156. The sum of all cells per each watchtower quadrant is 12 times 13. If D had drafted the Enochian system even slightly differently at this stage, the result would be drastically different in the final tabulations. If each of the four watchtower quadrants had 144 cells, only 12 squared, then the full model, excluding the black cross dividing between them, would have had 576 cells in total. If each of the four watchtower quadrants had 169 cells, 13 times 13, then the full model, likewise excluding the black cross, would have had 676 cells in total. Only D's unique combination of 13 rows and 12 columns yields the sum 624. And, given the options of 576, and 676. The sum 624 is by far the most versatile in corresponding multiple systems in a single framework. 576 plus 48 equals 624. 676 minus 52 equals 624. 48 equals 12 times 4. 52 equals 13 times 4. 12 times 48 equals 576. 12 times 52 equals 624. 13 times 48 equals 624. 13 times 52 equals 676. Because of D's four watchtower Enochian system being 624 cells total in four quadrants of 156 cells each, D's model is provided with an additional dimension that Descartes' coordinate plane, when measured solely as a square, although similarly divided into four quadrants, cannot have. In short, it allows for measuring the dimension of time. Now, what is time, exactly? If time truly is anything more than merely what we measure using calendars and clocks, then it may be seen as an invisible force, taking the form of a cycle, a repetitive pattern such as a spiral orbit inside a larger non-correlated area, such as in three-dimensional space, and measured by environmental changes due to this force, 
occurring on objects moving along or within that pattern. In this manner, time is simultaneously an invisible force inducing entropic motion. A spiral pattern conserving angular trajectory into negentropic orbitals and the consequential environmental changes occurring to all objects, including calendars and clocks, due to this force. D's base 156 Enochian system model works as a very complex form of calendar, similarly to an interlocking mechanical gear interface, and with a similar design to a standard clock face. Consider it simply thus, as a set of 16 sub-angles, incidentally of 30 cells apiece. Next, consider the four sub-angles at the inner core as independent from the 12 sub-angles that surround and box the men. Now, here we have the four core sub-angles capable of symbolizing the four elemental seasons on Earth, and the twelve surrounding sub-angles, likewise symbolizing the twelve zodiacal months in each earthly orbital year, the core set measuring the environmental changes, and the surrounding set measuring the cyclical shape that causes them. Consider each surrounding sub-angle a month, and the whole calendar round shape a year, and you will see that the flat rectangle expressed in two dimensions as the four Enochian watchtowers is, in true reality, a depiction of a circulating sinusoidal spiral seen from a point aligned directly above its centroid. From this it follows that there is, by necessity, a single accurate arrangement for the entirety of attributes assigned to this system later by the Golden Dawn, because these attributes are finite in sum and all are relative to each other. In other words, S. L. Mather's work on resolving the twelve zodiac signs from three recombinations, rows, of the four elements, columns, using the divine holy name of God, or tetragrammaton, yod heh and from thence applying these to D's Enochian system, is valid, but was left incomplete, at least in Rigardi's presentation of Mather's material in his Golden Dawn handbook, once worked through to its final logical extension, Mather's Concourse of the Forces diagrams proved to correlate to Dee's own vision of the roundhouse schematics, and both appear to function as measurements of motion on the four watchtowers tablet design. These motions are indicated simply enough by arrows pointing up or down and slanted left or right, or vice versa, assigned to each sub-angle, based on the orientation of each zodiac sign to its nearest neighbors in each sub-angle's recombination of the four elements. My own integrated reformed vector system presents Mather's attributes on D's model as accurately to reality as possible. Mather's Golden Dawn attributes are, obviously, not the only such sort of system that may be applied to Dee's Enochian model. The 16 sub-angles also may be likened to the 16 primary symbols of geomancy in a kind of Kabbalistic Book of Changes, but far more significantly, the twenty kin, day names, 
or the 19 weenal months of the Mayan calendar may be fit into each sub-angle of 30 cells, and likewise rearranged so that no two are alike, as can the 64 hexagrams of the I Ching be arranged on D's model to repeat exactly five times each by their occupying 320 of the 480 total cells in all 16 sub-angles. And so, likewise, can the 36 deacons of the ancient Egyptian solar civic calendar be placed on each deacon cross for a total of four deacon crosses of 144 total cells. The exact calibration of all these attributes onto D's Watchtower's tablet model I call the Atlantean calendar because it, theoretically, may have predated the world flood. The Atlantean calendar's elemental predictions only differ from reality as we experience it daily to the extent that the calendar symbolizes an idealized fourth-dimensional metaform, a holy template on which our own reality is loosely based. While the reality we experience daily is an imperfect copy, several steps removed from this original ideal pattern. In the same manner Kepler rightly estimated the distances of the planetary orbits away from the Sun using the inverse square law, etc. By working backward from an earlier observationally inaccurate yet more ideal model, his Harmonia Mundi material, we may make accurate predictions about future events in reality based on the position of the attributes at the corresponding time on the calendar. The events we experience in our mundane material reality differ only in slight discrepancies from the outcomes predicted for each moment by the complete Atlantean calendar. Indeed, their differences can be said to be in degree, if not only, then at least mostly and certainly more so than in detail. What the 22 trump cards of Tarot are for the archetypal psychological hero's journey, describing the human monomyth, the Atlantean calendar is for the arrangements of elements throughout our entire Milky Way galaxy over duration of no fewer than 12 aeons, of 2,000 years apiece. The Atlantean calendar is a one-to-one -one scalable map of time. It may be speculated that Enochian angels are the guardians of time in much the same way the archangels protect about heaven and cacodemons proliferate in hell. Or rather, as the mind may expand or contract within three space, and thus experience angelic or demonic visions while doing so, so too may the mind move forward or backward along the mainstream timeline, observe all eddying branches off it as the Enochian system, and encounter their own past id, atavism, and future superego, avatar, through the means of remote viewing or scrying while meditating on the Atlantean calendar. However, always heed the warning that a mind, once distended, can never regain its original dimensions. And so, likewise, it may be said that once one has left their body, one may as well have lost their mind, because, as it is also said 
You can never step in the same river twice. And, for that reason, it is true that you can never go home again once you have set out in pursuit of practical magic. Indeed, practical or ritual magic, including Enochian theurgy, may be merely a vestigial memory left over from a time prior to the world flood when a higher technology was present allowing people greater control over their immediate surroundings. It is highly likely the rituals modern practical magic imitate date back at least to the Neolithic Kurgan peoples who built megalithic tumulus mounds by erecting a small tabletop of two or more upright monolithic menhirs supporting a final capstone lintel monolith buried under soil. The likelihood of these Kurgan mounds being a direct predecessor of long later Native American sweat lodges is nearly entirely inarguable, and the Kurgan culture's origin from just west of the Black Sea, places them at the genetic source point for the also long later Paracas culture of Peru, South America, who elongated their skulls by cranial deformation. The more or less worldwide by then, Kurgan culture were, most probably, responsible for at least 8,000 years ago, constructing the temple complex at Gobikli Tape, found in modern-day Turkey, as an underground granary or seed bank. The Kurgan culture are also, although eponymously mound builders, credited with the invention of the wheel and the first taming of wild horses, in their beginning, the Kurgans may have been contemporary to the final extinction of the Neanderthals, a cousin species to our own modern Homo sapien species, as well as to the earliest development of speech and verbal communication, and by the end of the Neolithic era, just before the semi-nomadic Kurgan culture was finally seemingly subsumed into Sumero-Akkadian city-states, which later unified as the earliest empire, that of Babylon. The last Kurgans were certainly witness to the advent of the agrarian revolution, thatched, reed-reinforced mud-hut houses arranged in irrigated proto-cities, widespread use of baked clay pottery, the first metallurgy, earliest slavery, first priests, first cults to become religions, first polities, city-states governed by kings, and the eldest written languages, this shrinking Kurgan culture's final contribution may have been the gold shekel, the first metal coin used for money, possibly prior to their apparent migration to Peru to become the Paracas people. All of this remains, of course, only speculation as of the exact moment in history in which I am writing this, because archaeological excavations of sites the age of Gobikli Tape and older are still very uncommon. This situation is made even more difficult at present because of Western military powers, including the United States and Israel, having brought war 
to the entire Middle Eastern Levant region to destabilize their perceived competitors there and to seize the elemental assets of the lands, mainly the fossil fuel, crude oil. Nevertheless, it is an acceptable hypothesis that whatever we might today call superstitious, ritual, or practical magic had begun by the time of the Kurgan civilization. The practice of burial of the dead, even including grave good gifts for the corpse in its afterlife, is likely what sparked the initiation of the Kurgan culture. Beyond this, we can only guess where ritual magic began. Prior to the Kurgan culture, we nowadays know also of migrations of early Homo sapiens northwestward from Australia across a land bridge then still connecting it to South Asia, where modern Indonesia and Polynesia are today, in the region called Oceania. The continuous use there of cowrie shell money and the cat's cradle weaving game played with a loop of string do indicate the origins of, at least, the first rudimentary metaphysics then and there. What this rudimentary metaphysics indicated was the nature of time being seen as the difference between an object and itself, symbolized as, simply, two cubes synthesized into one by sharing a side, or the earliest form of a Kabbalah, what we would now call a tesseract. This prehistoric preoccupation with time stems from our age-old superstitious terror about mortality. This, combined with learning the ability to mentally keep count of large number sums and calculate basic arithmetic, led to the earliest metaphysics, and thus to the oldest now-known form of ritual or ceremonial magic. This is indicated somewhat by Paleolithic cave paintings, which could only have been rendered by firelight, being too deeply obscured from even reflected sunlight, as most are. The shaman would stand between the firelight and the cave painting and tell the young the epic tale of the hunt by casting their shadow against the wall. This evolved into Plato's allegory of the cave in regards to seeking enlightenment beyond merely the immediately observable and, by modernity, to silver screen cinema in stadium seating movie theaters selling mute audiences on a false hope of becoming stars. In the end, as they say in the pictures, there is only one truth. All facts are merely versions of it. The moral of all words will always be the same as that of this monomyth, expressing, simply, adaptation to environmental changes over time, resulting in survival and mating. This simple formula of sex and violence being the sugar and spice used to flavor a story about a character or characters who have to show progress away from their start by the end of the narrative is most likely also oceanic in origins as the rituals and unwritten stories of the area preserve intact a tradition dating back to the division of Australia from India and incorporate all the original primordial symbols of this essential monomythic tale.
the cosmic mound, the world tree, the division of man and woman, the war between the younger Olympian and the elder Titan gods, and finally the world flood. These elemental symbols of humanity's monomyth cannot presently be traced back any further than to the era of the oceanic land bridge, which had ended by 8,000 years ago, along with the melting of the final glaciers over North America that had restored the ocean water level to its current heights. Just as we have now looked back in time, mentally, we may next return our attentions again to the present moment and, by doing so, perform the same transform on our astral body, our aura, or soul, as we would to project our mind's eye ahead into the far-off future and mentally see ahead of time. We have to bring ourselves forward through time to return from the past and to be projected into the future and backward through time to return from the future and to delve into the past and we have to bring ourselves back to the present either way when we are done but again what is time? Can a timeline, such as the mainstream, forward-flowing arrow of entropy, be broken? And if so, can it then be mended and restored back to its prior normalcy? Picture the four watchtowers of the Enochian system as alike the four walls of a single cube as in the altar model, proposed in Book 4 by Aleister Crowley, based on the material of the Golden Dawn. Now, picture the inside of this cube, as like the usual color-coded watchtowers, and the exterior as like the Atlantean calendar. This is the complete Enochian communications system. When applied to the scale of the entire planet Earth, the ECS allows an instantaneously attainable, globally reaching, telepathic link to connect one part of anyone's mind to another part of anyone else's. This happens all the time, more or less unconsciously, but is usually only expressed in the vague symbolisms of subconscious dreams, and then it is so only by one's own ego reflecting over itself, disguised as an alienated otherness within the mystifying mists of sleep. The ECS functions basically like a psychic switchboard where every circuit is being connected, disconnected, and reconnected to every other as cause and effect, always. Each color-coded, truncated pyramid cell on the entire ECS four watchtowers altar walls is a spiraling vortex that can open a wormhole portal to connect to any other. This model is an intangible cube, the same volume as the Earth, and just as each cell in it may connect to any other, so too may it communicate to the cells of the unfolded Atlantean calendar model measuring across the whole planar Milky Way. 
the cells of the ECS around the Earth and the Akashic records of the Milky Way in the form of the Atlantean calendar also communicate between one another, and all these communications happen invisibly and at faster than light speeds. Likewise, all these cells communicate with Hakabalah's ultimate extension outward as the Tao sub Tao tesseract surrounding our parent cosmos. These are all layers and levels of a single, unified, holistic model, the Enochian communications system, which relates also, then, to the psyche of each sentient individual in a similar switchboard-like manner, connecting one part of the brain here to another there along the neurons in our cerebra. Again, however, this entire model is only an idealized metaform version of what appears to be the case in observable material reality. Instead of the tesseract of time, there are the intergalactic filaments strung about like a super slow motion lightning bolt. Instead of the Atlantean calendar superimposed upon the Milky Way's galactic spiral, there is only the black hole in the direction away from us of the constellation Sagittarius A in the core of the galaxy sending out gravity waves to influence all the stars and all the planets orbiting around it in the four swirling arms that form the plane of its accretion disk. Instead of the four watchtowers, walled, cubed, surrounding the planet Earth, it is only Earth's own electromagnetic field, caught into field lines and currents by Earth's gravity well. And instead of Kether, the crown sephirot of Hakabalah, or highest emanation of illumination from the Godhead, resting on the brows of all sentient minds, it is only doing so to some, a few, or even only just one at a time. 